like to uh, welcome in our next guest this morning. Our guests, I should sh- uh, say, as we talk about uh, security and active shooting and school shootings and, and all, all, all this stuff that is just, uh, I've got the, um, the country, um, you know, uh, shaking their head, really, and trying to figure out what to do. So we're going to bring in a couple experts, and we, we had a, a Sean Buteau on before from Trust But Fair, Verif, a Verify, and you've also brought someone in with you who is ex-law enforcement, and your name, sir, is Sean Pappas, right? Yes, sir. All right, well, welcome in, gentlemen. How are you doing today? Doing well. Doing it, good. It's Thank ni- you. It's nice to have you in here, even though we'll be talking about uh, you know the less uh, less fun things to be talking about in the world, but this is what we're being uh, confronted with now. Um, so, Trust But Verify is a security service um, specializing in what? Uh, Chris, actually, it's Trust But Verify Security Services, uh, tbvss.com. Uh, we're a full service security company, uh, provide security guards at uh, nightclubs, schools, roving patrols, and also uh, disaster relief. So, um, we offer uh, access controls, camera systems, things of that sort. Camera systems. All right. Well, I was. I uh, I want to ask you about my camera system. <laughs> no, I'd have to have you come over to my house. We can help you out with that. Because <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know where where I put them is the best place for them. But uh, we don't need to get into my personal stuff today. <laughs> we got more important uh, pressing things. As a matter of fact, I don't even know exactly where to begin. Do we? Uh, I tell you. Here's where we'll begin. The kids from uh, uh, Marjorie. Stoneman Douglas High School returned to school today. All right, from uh, from your perspective, what are the the professionals that are surrounding that area today? What will be in their minds? Well, overall, is safety and uh, protocol for these guys coming in. Uh, they they want to make sure that uh, safety is a priority. They want to make sure that the uh, parents and the students and the staff members uh, feel secure and safe going back to their school. So uh, that is their priority, um, and it should be their priority. I have a uh, teenage son, and I'll tell you, as a parent, I would want to make sure that uh, that would be the priority of the local sheriff's office uh, in that area. Um, And uh, there's 50 uniformed officers that'll be there today. uh, but let's let's go back a couple of days and the controversy surrounding officers not going into the building. Now, I know, Sean, you and I have talked about this stuff before where you do not like to judge the, 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 the specifics of what happened at, because you weren't there and you don't know everything. So what we can talk about is protocol that you're aware of, you know, what what you understood should be done in those situations, no, you know, uh, allowing for that we don't have all the information. That being said, um, I can see how frustrating it would be for the parents to find out that not only did one off that first officer not go in, but then there, I guess there were other four others mm-hmm. that were not going in and allowed, I guess, up to four minutes to pass before they finally decided to uh, to go in. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, during an active shooter uh, situation, uh, <clears throat> we're trained to engage the threat, to go engage the threat i will say it again engage the threat um i can't begin to explain why the delay of four minutes of uh four officers uh did not engage the threat and go in and try to take that threat out okay Uh, that's uh that's unexplainable to me um sean uh will be able to give you more insight on that uh he was a uh, former. He's a former Pinellas County deputy. So, Sean. So, uh, by the way, both of my guests this morning are Sean, Sean Buteau and Sean uh, Pappas. Now, Buteau, your background. How uh, did you spend any time in local law enforcement, or were you? No, I've I've spent uh, uh, the majority of my career as a federal agent. Okay. Yeah, and uh, of course, Sean comes from the local side. All right. But uh, we've worked together over the years uh, on local task force teams, work very closely with state and uh, local uh, law enforcement agencies throughout. So, All right, so yeah. your perspective then from the local law enforcement angle. I, th- I think if, if one deputy or whoever it was at the scene, one deputy, one police officer, if they didn't go in, that's 
probably the fault of that deputy. Maybe they should have been discovered earlier that they didn't have the the metal to do something like that. Training should have should have weeded that person out if okay. they were introspective enough about it. However, if there's several that didn't do it, someone's telling them not to go in there. Okay. That, that would be my that would be my perspective on that. If one of us screws up, it's my fault. If we all screw up, it's the boss's fault. Okay. Um, what about is is there something in law enforcement because this particular district district is uh, is a very safe uh, affluent district. Mm -hmm. Is the, is there a chance that um, you know some some people will gravitate towards those uh, areas, knowing that they will likely never have to engage in, in somebody, and so they are just caught flat footed, even though they went through the same training as everybody else. They thought they kind of had a cakewalk, or is that not even a fair thing to even throw I, out in the universe? I think that's fair. Okay, and I think the systems kind of there's people that are on midnight shift. <clears throat> Uh, in patrol that you want catching burglars trying to get into your house and into your car and that sell drugs and things like that. You want them out there. You don't necessarily, I wouldn't think we necessarily want that same person in a school eight or nine hours a day because they're, they're kind of a different animal. That's not to say that there's not school resource officers that are absolutely competent. And I'm, I know that a bunch of them are gritting their teeth when they saw this happening on oh. TV going, why aren't they doing it? Why aren't they going in there? But I think, as far as school administrators go and agencies go, you need a safe person in there, maybe not someone who's the the best warrior or the most right, eager right, to go get right. into the mix. Now, Sean, would it be safe to say that usually in those positions they would put someone closer to retirement out to work in those positions? I think that's, uh, that be that's one of those places where maybe someone, you know, reaching the twilight of their career, maybe they would go mm -hmm. there. But I, there's also... There's uh, younger people also that also find those spots. I mean, we have this, we have some misconceptions about who's actually in law enforcement now, and it's a different type of person. Agencies are hiring different types of people than they did 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. Can you uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Like, what do you mean by who were they hiring 30 years ago? 30 years ago, was it those warriors you were talking I about? Think 30 years ago, it was uh, a lot of veterans, uh, people that didn't. People that were probably a little more quick with their hands than people are now. Now we have deputies and officers that are technology dependent. They have that taser and they treat it like an extra set of balls. Uh, the generation of guys that trained me when I grew up, they would, it, an incident wasn't as likely to get out of control then because they, they had the fortitude and they knew the bosses were behind them and they would end it as soon as possible before things got out of control. There's a lot or more. Now there's a lot more micromanagement going on. And also, you were talking, uh, one of my uh, cousins has been going through this process. And I couldn't, when we were sitting down and talking about it, what I couldn't believe was how much he was talking about psychology. He was talking more and more about psychology and people and relationships than he was talking about tactics and strategies and, and whatever. Well, and I think that's the, the elephant in the room for me is this deputy or the deputies that were there may have had active shooter training. So it's a, they checked a box for him, active shooter training. That, that incident, that tragedy that happened there, that's something that a military unit trains daily for. I mean, that's a really, really difficult tactical problem to handle. Uh, where I think now they're, they're much more, police are much more serving in a role of social workers and dealing with people with mental illness of varying degrees. And I think the warrior drug part, people that are on drugs part, or drug oh, and yeah. both, you know, they they'll dispatch a 22 year old patrolman to a mental hospital to deal with somebody because the doctors can't. So right now, Sean, let me ask something. Would it be like of training? I I gotta tell you, I just don't get the time lapse before anybody went in there. I mean, we train, we train, we train, we train to engage that threat. Uh, would it be lack of training? Uh, tell me, what do you? Do? I, I, when uh, I first heard that, heard the sheriff there, and I don't remember the exact quote because I turned the TV off and discussed about, you know, he's uh, it was a failure of training and it was a failure of this, that, and the other. I can I can remember being in training and there was every now and then someone came through where we went this this is not the job for this person, and regardless of what we said or how vocal we were at the at the. The ground level, the bosses would decide to push that person through. So I don't know if that person had somehow stood out beforehand where they shouldn't have been in a scene like that. They shouldn't have been trusted with guarding our children 
or there was other overriding factors at work. You know, when a school goes into lockdown, they're really good at locking down. That makes it very difficult for the police or anyone else to get in. I, uh, I think there's still some questions to be answered um, mm-hmm. there. Uh, but let's let's not just pile on uh, just law enforcement in that moment because we also there seems to be a breakdown from on the FBI side of things. There seem to be a trail of incidences, um, uh, 911 calls, reports about this kid. Uh, and matter the one of the ones we brought up yesterday were former neighbors of his that says that I don't want to be living next to him when he turns 18 and is able to get an AR-15 because he wrote specifically, I can't wait to turn 18 so I can get a rifle and shoot up a school. And so can you guys speak to, to that part of it? Um, the, because I know, you know, we, we want to jump all over the FBI now and go, all right, now it's, it's you guys, where did you break? But I have a feeling if we spend a day in the shoes of a federal agent trying to uh, you know, disseminate or, or go through this information and, and figure out what's good data, what's not good data, it would prob- it'd probably be a very eye-opening experience. Well, I, I gotta tell you, the, our FBI, our federal agencies, our local or state are premier. I mean, our, our guys that are out there are well-trained, uh, some of the best training in the world that uh, we're subject through, um, we go through. So that being said, uh, the majority of our agents, majority of our law enforcement are top notch, okay? Um, What occurred here, and you know, we're just hearing this from the news, right? What's been exposed to us through the news is there was a breakdown in communication. Basically, uh, an anonymous uh, phone call came in, uh, a tip line. That tip did not go to the SAC office. Okay, uh, that's what we're being told. And uh, once it goes to the main office in that area, uh, the SAC office is special agent in charge office, okay? They are in area like Miami office. They, they cover a certain area, okay? Um, and what would happen is that would come in and that would be uh, addressed by an investigator in that area. Okay. So what the news is saying is that that tip came in. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't put out to the local office. It's a communication thing. Right? We have to work on this. We have to work on the communication. Uh, we have to make some changes, uh, for sure. All right, so there's a lot of talk, obviously a lot of controversy now, uh, You know, everything from gun control to arming teachers and so on and so forth. So let's uh, delve into a couple of those um, topics. From your perspectives as local law enforcement, as federal law enforcement, and I also don't, uh, you know, when I do stuff like this, I don't like to... Uh, go, okay, so you guys are speaking for everybody in law enforcement. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this right. is this is your personal experiences right. from your vantage point. You know, how do you look at this? Let's start uh, with arming teachers. Um, obviously, we don't. It, it, you can't just do, do a blanket. All right, we're arming everybody. Everybody goes take these classes. That's ridiculous. What it would come down to are those who either A, are already, uh, you know, they're carrying or, you know, they, or have their CWPs, have military experience, stuff like that, or in people who are interested that would come forward. And we go, okay, we'll train you. I, I mean, how do you go? To, let's not even talk. We don't even have to get into the logistics right now. We get how you would pay for this kind of stuff because that would be a huge bill to go down that path. But if we're if America wants to you know, spend that money, we'll spend that money. How do you guys see that? Well, well, let's start off with insurance. I, I mean, what would, a, <laughs> all right, what would a school You're have right. to actually incur for an expense to have their teachers Arm. And these are some of the things that we don't think about when we're like, well, just arm the teachers. It, not, well, you go down that path, and all, you're right. All of a you're, sudden, your, you're your talking, insurance policies you're, go. You're talking huge money. And, yeah. you know, I'll tell you, uh, just because you have a concealed weapons permit, okay, uh, a lot of the, the guys that I trained, they need advanced training, okay? You need to be trained, 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 trained at the range on that. You just stick a teacher out there that has CWP doesn't know really, okay, in a situation, active shooter situation, your adrenaline's going, uh, you know, you're, you've got to think things through. You've got to take that moment and go, okay, training, reflect back on my training. They just don't have it. 
All right, and Mr. Pappas, from your perspective, if uh, local law enforcement, there is something going down to school and you're going to that school and say there's records, you know that there are a dozen teachers that are allowed to carry on campus. Are you excited about that as you're going to that school or are you going, oh shit, now I have to deal with these people too? I think if that's, first off, the the deputies in South Florida that dealt with this incident, they were handed essentially a flimsy paper plate full of poop on it and said, make this better. The decisions that they could make under high stress were were made between bad and worse. However, the, the historically, and there's plenty of data since Columbine on the different uh, active shooter incidents, ones that happened at schools, churches, uh, businesses, whatever, there's plenty of data to suggest that they only last a few minutes. Something stops the shooter. Either there's no reset button on the game and it's not happening the way They want it to, and they shoot themselves. Someone disarms them when the gun stops working, uh, or they run from the scene, much like this guy did. He just blended into the crowd. For, and I can only speak from my perspective, for me to show up at this scene at a a giant school that I've never been to before, even this building here that I've never been in before, and then expect me to run through it like it's a shoot house, find the one person that's the shooter and shoot effectively without shooting anyone else around them or not, causing any more uh, death and destruction, I think is, you know, that's a tall order for anybody, whether the finest military unit in the world. But, mm-hmm. you know, we, we expect some some police officer or deputy that maybe had active to come shooter in to be training. To a superhero, in really. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and don't make it worse. Right. Don't shoot through that person and they hit somebody else because right. then you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I think there, clearly there was a breakdown in a communication with the tips that people were calling in about this guy. There was, I heard there was tips to the local agency. There were tips to the FBI. He certainly wasn't an unknown, just this mass, nobody ever heard of this guy before. I think there's a lot of onus on schools and the legislature about this though. You think since Columbine, there hasn't been any real meaningful anything done at a school to make the students safer. I mean, there's there's plans to call this, we'll, we'll do this, uh, this color procedure, it's a code green or whatever, or there's a, you know, a bulletproof book bag. But essentially, the the orders to schools are lock your doors, trap all your victims in place, right? And we'll let this while they do nothing. Well, so that's what that's one of the proposed uh, uh, solutions to this problem is to put special doors in every classroom. So when this goes down, you shut you shut them, lock them, and they can't you know they can't get in. They're not and they're not shooting through the doors either. Right. And maybe that's. That's, that could be a wonderful idea, but I think someone there at the scene has to be able to stop them, and the only way to stop them is with a gun, whether that's a professional that's hired there, whether that's a select few group of teachers or administrators, but then they're also going to have to have the metal to actually find that person and take care of business. So it comes down to training, right? I mean, if we go into a school situation, you you have to train school staff, uh volunteers law enforcement security we all have to be on the same page continuously training okay what's working what isn't working because each school is different right you can't buy you can't go by okay well this school set up this way so we're going to run this school just like we're running this school. right right can't do it right right every school is designed differently they are you know it, it's laid out different the training, uh, the teachers, everybody's going to be on the same page, and you have to have continuous training. So now that, that this has gone down, you know, we saw a, um, uh, an article yesterday that there were they saw record numbers at this uh, Tampa gun show that was just in town. They they were their minds were blown. They go, we have never seen so many people here. There's an uptick in fear. Um, so trust by but ver- verify. I mean, this is so. It was your phone ringing off the hook. Uh, the day after the shooting or the days after the shooting? I have been doing active shooter training just about every day since the incident. Okay. Okay. Churches, schools, uh, corporate offices, we go in and we do that. When people come come to you, are they frantic? Are they like, uh, when can we get in your schedule? When can you get in here? No, I, you know, I think it's always been on your minds, right? They've been thinking about it for and processing it for a long period of time. We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. Unfortunately, it takes an incident like this for someone to pick up the phone and say, "Look, we we're serious. We got to get this done." 
So, um, you know, and you go in, you give a basic active shooter training, it's not good enough. Okay, you've got to follow up on that. You have to go further than that. Okay, and look at, okay, what works for your corporate office? What, you know, uh, what's what, your what, exit? What, yeah, well, what are, you, what are you talking to them about? Because I'm sure it's more than just um, uh, here, your, know your exits, and if stuff starts to go down, you, you're back into this, whatever. I'm sure you're like, okay, you also need some cameras here. You need to, the access that you have over here. You need to shore that up. You know, so what? I'm sure that's a big process, right? Well, we talk about, yeah, yeah I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, but we talk about, okay, who's going to, uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to call 911? Uh, how are you going to do that? If you got the threat right there, how about if the person is supposed to call 911 is laying over on the desk dead because they're shot? Who takes over from there? Where do you go? You know, if you have to hide, uh, you know, if you got to take concealment or, uh, you know, barricade, what is the difference between the two? These types of things we talk about. Well, you know, the last time that uh, Sean was in here, we were talking about uh, stuff like this. I said, well, you know, I'm trapped in, a, in the corner here at Bake More Pies. I, somebody comes in here, I'm screwed. He's like, no, there's ways. I'll show you once uh, once we, once we the cameras are off. And so that's why I've got uh, strapped under my desk now a sawed-off shotgun. Because that's that's my last thing. <laughs> I just got something. Hopefully, I hopefully it's like pointing that way, not this way. Hopefully it's going that way. I thought the corner right. and the steps was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so... Um, uh, when when uh, people you know they're, they're just watching um, and they're a little concerned themselves they're concerned for their child going to school every single day now they're, they send them off to school and they're going oh my god you know what what's going to happen are they going to make it home um, when they're going off to uh, work you know you have a lot of people that work for um, well the media my friends in the media the security that surrounds radio studios now and television studios now is insane compared to what it was just 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so people are going to work, and it used to be that this stuff wasn't even in the front of their mind. This this stuff just was not in the front of your mind. Now it is. Now you see one guy that just looks a little bit shady, and you're noticing. And I don't know, maybe that's a good thing that we're noticing now. I think the takeaway from all this should be we should all take a deep breath. The focus should be on uh, all these poor kids that were slaughtered, and that's what it was. It was a slaughter. Uh, understand that there's a breakdown in communication between people that were calling in about this guy and everything else. And the, the, the cops apparently didn't do a perfect job when they showed up at the scene. They, I think ultimately they did the best they could with what they had. But your kids, you, me, we are responsible for our own safety. There is no, I can, I can just sit back and I'll call 911 and they'll sprinkle fairy dust around and everything's going to be better. You're, you're responsible for your own safety all the time. So you're you're a proponent that when you see uh, Grady Judd get up and say, hey, by the way, I think everybody should be, or I know that he wasn't the one that said that. Or was it him or another was. sheriff? One of the sheriffs I, said, you know, I, I think everybody should be armed. You you are more in that category? Absolutely. Okay. Makes for a polite society. And I'm not an open carry guy. I You know, I have no idea if you're armed. I have no idea if he's armed. I'm just, with sure. these gun, just with these guns Joey's right here. Joey's armed. Joey's <laughs> armed. Yeah, but I think these, you know, the... Politicians are the ones that are going to make out with this. There's the sheriff down there who's, you know, he's he's saying that he's provided amazing leadership and everything else. And now Grady Judd's out. At the end of the day, they are all politicians. Yeah, they are absolutely Once politicians. Once you get to that level, one's learned to master the media more than the other one. He used to be the PIO for that agency, so he has a little more experience. And we can see that that first day they got rid of that off that deputy. That was like, oh my god, this. He's the fall guy. Let's get rid of him. And I'm sure they brought him into a room. They sweated him and said, "You're you're quitting today. You're this is your fault. You're out." And it was just it was politically expedient for them to say that. To wash their hands of the guy. And at uh, but to go back to your original point there, it, you know, we we in the times like these, we want to start arguing about uh, guns or teacher or whatever, whoever, law enforcement. But you're right. There are 17 families that are still trying to put their lives together. Now, one thing I want to say is this, is that um, for me personally, I went to my son and I gave him a class on what to do. And, I, you know, I was like, it's, it's sad that we have to do this. 
which said that we have to How old talk your son? to our, he's 14. So what right? kind of, what, yeah, what conversation did you have so, with your 14 Well, if someone comes in your school with a gun, what do you do? If someone, you know, where do you go? How, what's the protocol? A hide, if you, you know, where are you going to run to? Those types of things are being addressed. We have to address them with our children. It's unfortunate, but we do. We have to educate them. We have to. I, and it's it's sad I, that we have to do that, but it's almost like the mentality of don't talk to strangers, right? Re- religion, I think, has helped me. Now, I'm not a religious person. This is going to seem a little bit uh, paradoxical because I'm not a religious person. I was raised with religion. Uh, do I believe that there's things bigger than us? Yes. Do I? And so with that, I think there are things out of our control. So for me, because um, I've had this conversation with my relatives and uh, the, you know, uh, an uncle of mine, has a story where he goes, I saved my family. I, I don't know what would have happened to my family had I not had a shotgun when somebody tried to come in my house, you know, years ago. Um, I, 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 I come from that stupid delusional place of whatever is going to be is going to be, you know? Like I can only control so much, so I'm not going to uh, get a gun myself and go get all the training and this and this for the, what? What, 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 what are the chances that someone like me, not, not you, not you, someone like me, stops, uh, de-escalates a situation versus escalates a situation. You should come to class with me. You'll be the best. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I think there's, you can't, uh, when a ship's sinking, you can't learn how to swim. So even if all that training does is provide you with perspective, like, yeah, I'm jumping out of a window. I'm getting out of here because I am, this is not for me. Okay. Even if it only does that, then at some level that was successful. Okay. So this is more than a gun control issue. It's a mental yes. health yes. issue. It's uh, it's setting up education within our schools, corporate offices, whatever you're doing, churches. You know, it's really looking at the whole picture and saying, okay, how do we be proactive, taking a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach to something, you know, like security. Unfortunately, we've been taking the reactive approach for too long. We need to be proactive. We need to be proactive on mental health issues. We have to be proactive on gun issues. We have to be proactive on security. Really take it, you know, and look at it and say, we need to do something instead of reactive. Everything's a reactive approach and because we don't want to do because it's because basically like when you go to a company or a a a, a ceo calls you a president calls you and says i want you to come in here and do this well what does that do that immediately changes the uh the 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 vibe in the building like you know dynamics right Right. it's changed because now we've gone through this we can visualize that Mm -hmm. tragedy and so it is that your uh, cubicle you, mates having going through a divorce, he's going to come to work and try to kill us all. Right. So, yeah, now <laughs> those things are in your head, too. And so I know they want to guard against that. But it's almost like uh, you're trying to protect a child and not allow them to grow up and go, no, well, here's the real world. Yeah, we've got, uh, you know, 700 people in this office. We fire people, you know, four times a week. Mm-hmm. And who knows when one day one of those will come back I, to us. I think that uh, uh, an outlook that I would have on this from the, from the, tr- the trainer's perspective is, Uh, We practice things that we're good at, but we must train on the things that we need work on. And I'll contrast that with an elementary school or a middle school or whatever. How often do they have fire drills? Right, right. They they learn about fire drills in kindergarten. Hold the little line, follow the teacher, and go outside. How often do they ever train for an active shooter or practice with the kids? And I think back, uh, you know, we had a fire drill, however, what, once a semester or something like that? Mm -hmm. How many fires do I recall from my years in school never none right. how many tornado drills if you're from the midwest right. right right and the same thing you probably never had to do it Mm-mm. and we should be looking at these active active shooter situations the same way well another thing it comes down to finances right uh, that's so true. nobody wants to pay for security nobody wants to pay for it because when you go into an office you go into a school you go into a church Money is always an issue of saying well you know we really are on a tight budget we don't want to spend the money here uh, how can we cut costs or how can, you know, and that has to change. It really does. We yeah, have to put security right there. We I have can, to. It like, needs to be a priority. There's also still this euphemistic, if we have a no violence policy and we have a sign up that says this is a gun free zone, well, then nothing bad will happen because everyone follows the rules. I mean, yeah. that's just, I, 
Right. That boggles right. my mind. If right. you think about the in, things that have happened in the last few years since Columbine, a gun-free zone is the most dangerous place you can go, potentially. You know, it's it's nice to see the citizens stepping up and saying, listen, we need a change. It, it's nice. And saying, look, we have to address this. Congress has to do something. They have to come to an agreement. Something needs to be done. Isn't it awful you that know? 17 kids have to die for us to talk about any of this stuff? It's and then ultimately even, we let the politicians control the narrative. Right. And it's not even, uh, we don't. For it, their benefit. It's more than 17. Mm-hmm. You know, because we've been trying to have this conversation since Columbine, I think, you know, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, roadblocks along the way. But then I think we'll start getting into politics and lobbyists and uh, and whatnot. And that's out of our uh, yeah, I expertise. Don't talk about yeah, so, all right. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it was a pleasure having you both in. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if you guys are interested at your office or wherever you are to uh, have this kind of training, have them just come by and talk to you about uh, uh, how safe you are. Uh, please do. Um, track them down at tbvss.com because that is Trust But Verify Security Services, tbvss.com, or it's a phone number they can reach you at. 844-938-7878, 844-938-7878. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll, see, well, hopefully I won't see you too soon. Hopefully not. Hopefully I won't uh, see you too soon. Yeah. Or I'll see you in a, in a more uh, social setting. How That's about it. that? That would be better. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. All thank right. you so much.